Hello, everyone. Bienvenidos. I am Dr. Shelley Rodschaefer, and I teach in the World Languages Department as well as Inquiry and Expression, and I'm the director of the Contemporary Writer Series. So I would like to invite you for our last author of the 21st season. And um, we typically invite four different authors each academic year. And we focus on a variety of different genres, poetry, essay, nonfiction, narrative, fiction. And um, tonight we have an amazing poet. Before uh, we invite him to the stand to perform and read some of his poetry, I would like to uh, celebrate some of our Contemporary Writer Series programming board. First, I would like to acknowledge um, poet Linda Nemec Foster. Would you please stand here a moment? She is our founding person here and has helped create this series. And then as well, if you are part of the current programming board or if you've been on it previously, would you please stand as well? Thank you. So this has been a great project of love and um, with this series, we encourage student participation as well. And so for this moment, I would like to uh, have one of my students come up. She will be presenting Levi Romero, our poet. Um, Valentina Garcia is a English and Spanish double major, and she hopes to perhaps um, do a career in journalism, but she's aspiring author as well. And so please, help uh, me welcome her. Thank you. Good evening. I am so honored to be here today to introduce Levi Romero. Um, Mr. Levi Romero is a poet from Dixon, New Mexico, which is located in the Embudo Valley of the northern part of the state. This region, its environment and people, shapes his work. Romero is an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, where he earned bachelor and master degrees in architecture. At UNM, he has taught creative writing, Chicano and Chicana studies, and cultural landscape studies. Although he holds degrees in architecture, poetry has always interested him. By combining these two fields, he is able to design and construct stories that maintain the history of the northern New Mexico region. The history of the region and its inhabitants is conserved through an exploration of cultural and geographical landscapes. Romero's poetry is an act of remembrance. The following stanza from his poem Epigraph is just one example. The sierras are spotted with snow. It has been a good winter in the highlands. Look, el cerro de Tajique, one woman says to the others. It took our bisabuelos a week on burro to get here. Her thin finger points toward their ancestral homeland. Through remembering, poetry facilitates the search for identity. Embarking on this search is complex. In the prologue of Sagrado, co-author Spencer Herrera recalls the words of Tomás Rivera saying, he argued that Chicanos would be able to recover their cultural identity by delving into a labyrinth, by going into the deepest darkness of their existence where they are alone with themselves. Through Romero's poetry, we can see that this intricate journey cannot be completed without gaining an understanding of place. His labyrinth is northern New Mexico, and delving into the region is necessary to obtain and preserve cultural identity. This immersion into the labyrinth is expressed in Romero's poems from his use of regional dialect to the images he portrays. Community is an indispensable element in Romero's poems. It is present as he captures cultural sketches through poetry. It is present as he participates in constructing a memory of the past. It is present as he shares his appreciation for writing by hosting workshops for literary organizations, detention centers, and youth mentoring programs. 
His first poetry collection, In the Gathering of Silence, was published in 1996. He is also the author of A Poetry of Remembrance, New and Rejected Works, and co-author with Spencer Herrera and Robert Kayser of Sagrado, a photo poetics across the Chicano homeland. Poetry is not his only art form. Romero is co-director of the films Del Agua and Going Home Homeless, which received the People's Choice Award at the 2014 Tales Short Films Festival. In 1996, he was awarded the PBS Bill Moyers Language of Life Award in Poetry. In 2012, he was awarded the post of the New Mexico Centennial Poet. Please help me welcome Mr. Levi Romero. Thank you, Valentina. Um, were you born on Valentine's Day by any chance? No, uh, abuela. To abuela. There, so you're named after your abuela. My wife's uh, grandfather was born on Valentine's Day, and his name was Valentin, Valentin Rodarte. But uh, thank you so much for that introduction. That's one of the finest introductions I've ever received. And um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have to ask you for a copy of that. <laughs> Movie. And so with an introduction like that, what do you guys say? Let's just all go have a drink now. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you so much, uh, Aquinas, although I've been pronouncing it Aquinas, and Shelly tells me that that is actually the correct pronunciation. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Aquinas, and the Contemporary Writer Series for inviting me here. And um, I've just been really mesmerized by this world of Grand Rapids. Even before I got off the plane as we were flying in, I started looking at the landscape below and I couldn't help but recognize uh, all the agriculture and the fields and what I imagine is probably a really deep connection with the people and the land. And that is Nuevo Mexico for us as well, is this connection that exists with the land in Nuevo Mexico that has for thousands of years amongst the indigenous people and amongst my people, Los Nuevos Pobladores, the new settlers who arrived there almost 500 years ago, coming up the Camino Real from Mexico with Juan de Oñate in 1598. Uh, and so we're still there, uh, a blending and a mixture of cultures. Um, it is part of the United States, it is Nuevo Mexico, but it is neither new nor is it Mexico. <laughs> and so the saying in Spanish is, ni nuevo ni Mexico, right? <laughs> and I have a, it turns out that there's a paisano of mine uh, who's here, uh, who I just met a while ago, and he's from uh, just outside of Santa Fe. And where I grew up is north of Santa Fe, an hour from Santa Fe. And uh, as we were driving here, we noticed there was a car parked out in the street uh, with New Mexico license plates. So, hey, maybe um, Grand Rapids has more Nuevo Mexicanos than we might think, huh? And uh, so anyway, muchas gracias por la invitación. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, we had a really wonderful workshop and presentation earlier today, uh, this afternoon. Then afterwards, the plática, the conversations, the dialogue continued on uh, to when we went and had lunch. And it was just a really beautiful, wonder, wonderful gathering of people and sharing stories. And I think such amazing storytellers here too. It's like everybody is a natural born storyteller. And everybody's story is just as good and better than the last story you heard. It just seems to work out that way. And that's a healthy uh, community. Uh, people's stories and the way they're shared and the way they're told, it's an expression of a healthy community and I appreciate that because where I'm from, it's a lot, all about stories. And the stories are what keep us going. The stories are what remind us of our antepasados, of our ancestors. They also remind us of where it is that we set out to go and how it is that we're gonna get there. It's all based on historias, on cuentos. Uh, so muchas gracias, the stories were fantastic this afternoon. And one of the stories that was being shared actually was uh, some of the, uh, the faculty background as musicians or how they started out almost being musicians and then quite actually turn out because of the lack of discipline from what I think I gathered <laughs> from the conversations that I was hearing. Uh, but there was uh, an exception to that amongst one of the faculty. But so I wanted to open up with this first poem and dedicate it to those of us that were there uh, this afternoon. And it's called A Poem in G Minor. 
Back then, I never realized the discipline it took, the sacrifices you made, the aloneness you endured. At just 16 years old, what it meant to pursue your craft while the neighborhood boys thought it crazy, funny, your nightly walks up through the twisting orchard path. Sitting for hours in a room across the wall from the chicken coop with a hand-pecked sheet of music before you, under a bare hanging light bulb, soft yellow glow, and the occasional chick, and I mean chick, nuzzled in a box next to the electric heaters humming and buzzing. Your winter's breath hanging in midair like an extended note as you rubbed your hands or tucked them under your armpits for warmth and looking really much like a chicken, I should say. Would this not have made a great scene for an Andrew Wyeth or Norman Rockwell painting? What could it have been titled, Young Virtuoso Practicing in the Hen House While Friend Looks On? The cobweb ceiling, the earthen walls, cracked, flaking, enveloping your improvised orchestrations of solitude, the scent of adobe, straw, feathers, one foot arched and steady, the other tapping time, winter mud on the soles of your shoes, pausing to drain spit from your mouthpiece across the hay-strewn floor, your mumbled wisecracks about sophisticatedly dressed men in symphonies spitting out in similar fashion. I thought about it today, all these years later, as the afternoon's freeform radio program played Schumann and carried poetry across the airwaves. I thought about you, me, my pockets secretly stuffed with poems I would not dare share with everyone or anyone because back then in that neighborhood, cool dudes didn't write poetry or play the French horn. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that um, I remind my audiences of, that it's okay to clap at poetry readings. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, what, hey, there we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> See, um, that kind of helps me relax a little bit. <laughs> and you know, what, what about when somebody sneezes, what does that mean when somebody sneezes? Can somebody tell me? I can, I'm sorry, I can't hear? Your soul escapes. Yes, in that instant, your soul escapes your body, and so that's why they say, God bless. And so when a poet reads a poem, their soul has escaped during that moment as well. And so it's the applause, and during that moment of applause that the soul can come back and enter safely. <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> it certainly feels like your uh, soul has left your body. <laughs> Diablitos. Ay, mama, this morning the dragonflies were fluttering above the pond. Diablitos, diablitos you used to call them. Yesterday at the nursing home, your hair tied up in a bun, rouge applied to your cheeks by the attendant, a dab of color to keep the day cheerful and young. I had never seen your hair done that way before. You were always so stubborn that years ago you would not have allowed it so. These days, your hair in a bun and your stories once long and complete are fragmented with no beginning, no middle, and no end. Good poems all in that way. And how much longer, I wonder, before even they are gone, before you leave us alone and fluttering, our reflections rippling against the water, our auras settled across the meadow in colors of the dragonfly. No mas Dios sabe cuando, mijito, you've said on occasion. Death and dying, it's something we've only talked about occasionally in that loose form of broken structure and resolution working its way towards nothing, reaching for itself. In that final gesture and calculated language that finds itself woven and looped up and under, in and out until it's made its way through and through to the other end. A tapestry of the said and unsaid, of the thought about too much and of the dare not even think. What can one say? Death, life, living, dying. 
You tell a story that I find difficult to follow, and when you laugh at mid-sentence, I try hard to keep with the storyline and how it goes from a that to a this, but I realize that I've missed it again. Years ago, I would have thought that it was you and how you might have spun your story in a way that left the listener confused. The punchline coming in at mid-paragraph. But I see now that it's been me, us, a world around you that didn't quite catch the inside joke, the developing storyline, the drama, the mystery, the humor, the character unfolding. You had it all along, Mom. The poetry. Yesterday, the multicolored hairpins on your head settled like dragonflies, sprouted like the dandelions on the hillside. The sound, the reflection, the aura, the fluorescence, your voice, your tongue plopping against your bare gums like the sound of a pebble cast into the pond. You, who never commanded an audience by intention, or so I thought holding my ear to your words today as always. Ooh, la Mary Schwartz. Andaba en volada, llegó a la medianoche, casi desnuda a mi puerta y cayéndose. And then you break out into laughter at mid-sentence, between the sounds of a patient down the corridor screaming in a language that I can't understand. Verdad? Verdad, you ask, nudging me, just to make sure I'm following along. Mm-hmm. Así es, mamá. Así es. But I know I've missed it again, mamá. Ah, que mamá. The poetry and the verse between the laughter and the sunlight, prisms of color dancing like little devils, those diablitos, the diablitos. Mira, mamá, mira. Los Diablitos. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, I don't know, as I look out into the audience, it seems to me like it's an audience full of really good students, young and old. <laughs> Somebody just laughed, so uh, that's also telling of the deceitfulness of what one sees or makes out, right? Uh, the stories that we imagine, but so how many of you were actually really great, fantastic students in school? Uno, do, only two people. <laughs> and so the rest of you, uh, what was up with that, huh? <laughs> uh, so I belong to the D group. I'm a D grouper, okay? And so in the school that I went to, when I started out in elementary school, you had the A group, which some of you would have been in the A group, and then you had the B group, and then you had the C group, and then you had the D group, okay? Some of you may have also been part of the D group had you gone to my school. But the D groupers were the ones that pretty much were part of the social caste system in my village and in my community, and in communities like mine all throughout northern New Mexico, which is most of those kids, the D groupers, came from very traditional families. Traditional meaning that the family still spoke the language of the Castellano, the old language, the Spanish. They still lived off the agrarian traditions. They had not bought into modernity. They were not the ones that were working at the labs in Los Alamos. Okay, they were ones that still tending to the traditions and the orchards and the fruit trees and the gardens the way their grandparents had. And so somehow, if you came from a family like that, you wound up in the D group. And so I was one of those D group students, which also meant that basically you were gonna wind up in prison and or dead at a very young age, okay? So this poem is called High School English and I dedicate it to all the D-groupers. Not long after my high school English teacher had passed the colored pencils out, I summoned her attention. I can't see what I'm writing, Mrs. Rutassel. I called out. She laughed. I knew you'd pick the white pencil, she said. She had come to know me by then through my daily journal entries and unending stream of poetry and essay submissions, my passion for writing, my disdain for authority, my clumsiness with conformity. She, my first audience harshest critic and first truly devoted fan. 
I was the quiet, quiet, introverted, skinny kid with way past the shoulder length hair and a Levi jacket on my back through every season. Inside myself, I looked like bearded Whitman, but probably more realistically resembled my Tio Eliseo thumbing in kerosene lantern light through the farmer's almanac, his green plastic bill reading cap at a 45 degree angle to the page. It was a love-hate relationship, me and Mrs. Rutassel. I linguistically steering myself through the muted storm between us, communicating through punctuation marks and grammatical rules, fleck like little black sugar ants charting out across the page, and her, I like that, good job, exclamated notations steering me along. One day I'm just going to write a book without commas or periods or question marks, I told her. Well, that's fine, she told me, but don't leave them out on account that you don't know where they belong. In my dormitory room, I read Rambeau, Steinbeck, and Camus. I stared out through the window at the leafless trees and the sky, the color of far away from home lonesomeness. I listened to music, studied songs and lyrics, Dylan's greatest hits, volume one, Johnny Cash Live at Folsom Prison, Al Hurricane, Los Purple Haze, Freddie Brown, and a two album Vanguard collection of Mississippi Delta do blues. My scratched albums turning with a quarter cent piece set on the stereo's needle arm to keep the music from skipping as one week, one season one year one adolescent tragedy spun into another and when the weather warmed I walked the railroad tracks and I laid out my jacket and my longing and my desperation and I waited on the westbound trains I never hopped an aching for my recently deceased father roaring through me like the rattly clackerly whistling Atkinson in Topeka it was springtime, and back home, one brother was cleaning out the ditches, and the other one was looking for the pruning shears. After walking the rails, I headed back toward campus with an overly fondled copy of Bound for Glory in my back pocket, hoping to catch a quick game of pickup ball before dinner and a long, cool glimpse of that one girl. What was her name? Oh, I can still smell the sweet grass and hear the sprinklers going strong. Something about her in a tight red t-shirt in that time long ago, now gone. I like girls that had good penmanship and could exercise the rules of proper grammar correctly. Knowing where to put the comma and the period and the semicolon meant something. I don't know what it meant, but I had an attraction to it. It may have come from a time back in fourth grade when I had beat the prettiest and smartest girl in a spelling bee contest. That year, I had risen out of the ranks of the D group students, the ones bound for prison and or a life lived and terminated before the age of 30, the ones who spoke the Spanglish of their grandparents as a first language, with accents thick and soft and musky as the upturned earth rolling off their grandfather's horse drawn plows the ones who found themselves having to make accommodations in their inherited world perspective for Biff and Tiff, and the prospect of a janitorial job or a starch mechanic shirt with their real baptismal given name scrawled across their lapel in cursive writing. And I can still to this day smell the waxy fat orange crayon melting on a sunlit desktop while I stood in the corner where they sent little boys who wanted to draw cars instead of turkeys and pumpkins. With the rest of the class behind me slumping over their assignments like neat rows of punctuation marks. And I even knew what an apostrophe was and how to use it without ever having been told, though I refrained from using it because I knew that knowing more than you were supposed to know meant that your silence couldn't be trusted. In junior high, the gentleman who we called El Culon Fatso, the music appreciation teacher flung up his orchestrating arms one more and a half final time and marched off to the admin office to charm the secretaries and sip on soft drinks while we sat stewing in the overheated metal annex building co-authoring pages of I shall not hit anyone. For the bullies would hit you again if you didn't write your share of their 900 lines. But that was before boarding school and Mrs. Rutassel. In boarding school, the first thing they said to me was also one of the last things they said to me, which was, if you don't cut your hair, you can't come to school here. Maria, the school's ESL teacher, counselor, and friend of Mrs. Rutassel's, had heard from someone that I was an artist and wrote poetry. 
She'd heard from someone that my father had recently died. I, being fluent in Spanish, proclaimed that I had no need for bilingual classes, and my strong self-determination and inner anti-wimpiness mocked the need for counselors. But Maria called me out of the hall one day, befriended me, and lip-pointed me towards a blank wall, crying out for a mural. Ahí está, she said, pinta lo que quieras. And then she reached into her desk drawer and handed me my first collection of literature, literatura chicana, texto y contexto. Toma, she said, something I think you'll like. And in that anthology were two poems that moved me in a way that I had never been moved before. El Louis, an un trip through the mind jail, a la máquina, a la mori, a la master. My literary senses were startled awake by the language and themes that these two poems were revealing to me, the colloquial poetics of a voice sounding like mine, written in that distinct dialectical syntax of those dudes hanging out behind the school gym. Remember the flunked out older guys sitting in the seats behind you, slingshotting their index finger at the back of your skull? Did you guys go to a school like mine? Were there guys like those there? Yeah? So you remember those kind of guys, right? It was a voice that sounded like that. Hey, before then I thought a poet had to sound like Frost Whitman or Dickinson. I didn't know I could write and sound like Jose Montoya and Raul Salinas and make the language of the page seem like it was coming from the tongue of my deepest personal introverted, most unpunctuated, pero bien, bien loco totote self. Loco tototote is like a really, really loco, loco word, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you understand loco tote? Did they use that word in Glorieta and Pecos and all that? Were there some pretty locote dudes there when you were growing up? Oh, well, los amo, yeah, okay, that doesn't even count. <laughs> you were not a D grouper, bro. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just teasing you, man. Uh, but yeah, Los Alamos, almost all the people from my community work in Los Alamos or did at one point or another. Uh, it's one of those kind of things where a lot of the traditions that we've had have been lost because of Los Alamos. But if it were not for Los Alamos, those villages probably wouldn't exist. So it's ironic in that way. Is there a version of Los Alamos around here in, at, in uh, Grand Rapids anywhere? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what are you going to do? You need to work. You need you go to Amway, right? Pero que pasa when you go to work at Amway? Something happens. <laughs> Nobody's saying what, right? Yeah. I am that way because I work at Amway. <laughs> ah, but as I was saying, Nancy, you who ask questions and whose interest so compels me to engage in conversations marred by all too quick break over, gotta get back to work interruptions while I walk away still fumbling for lucid explanations for whatever it was that we were almost talking about. And all becomes lost anecdote, life storyline unfinished. And no, in my family, we are not that smart. But how nice of you to see, I mean, say that because maybe we were. And at times, it has did feel that way. But now, we are incomplete again, mi familia. 20 some years ago, my father died in that many years it took to get to the letting go. And then the death of my brother last summer, again, death again. And over the years, another brother gone down, the down road of otro dia, otra pena. Again, life again. Although at one time, it was not as such. The irrigation ditch in front of my mother's house gurgled with the sound of water snaking under the swaying tree through lazy dog-eyed summer afternoons that hummed with a sleepy lullaby of, ah, oh, so much to do, I'll get to it tomorrow. And while one generation slowly nodded off, another one was waking up to life's harsh questions, for which there were no real questions, for the answers that became seemingly more unreal and undeserving than the questions themselves. Life, Nancy, was a little all too eloquent 
for the language we bear through calamities and tragedies and phones ringing in the startled night, leaving us numb with stubborn look ahead gazes in our tongues in a knot. And yet there are also memories of Sunday afternoons, special because, just because, and celebrated with great taco dinners with my sister's homemade salsa, spicy and juicy and dripping down chins and laughter splattering through the kitchen's north window, across the orchard, and away, away, away. And a baby that came unplanned with new life and joy, savior of almost broken beyond repair, spirit home refrain, laughing, laughing, laughing again, again, again. And now she too is grown. Her high school commencement this past spring marks a new turn in the road and we make way without realizing that we do. And when she sang, don't ever lose the light in your eyes at the Pecos High School graduation to a standing ovation, I stepped outside and the tears burned against the wind in my eyes. And I walked across the meadow and I stood under a grove of aspen trees, their trunks carved and etched with names and initials of who loved who and when and from then until always. And I thought of my brother and how I missed him so and how I wish he'd been there. And later on in the afternoon after the reception and a slight rain, a double rainbow across the sky informed me that he had been. Around here, we just take the good with the bad, my mother used to say. On Friday nights, sometimes I'll get the urge to eat beanie weenies and Vienna sausages on crackers. And I think of my friend Timmy, teenage friend, blood brother, shared dreamer of life to come, and how we'd sit parked across La Otra Banda Bridge in his 72 Cutlass Lowrider, through pre-dawn picnics, laughing and eating pork and beans and weenies, and sharing a last swig of Boone's Farm with a rushing spring thaw rolling under and rumbling away, away, away. All right, thank you. Um, here's a short little poem. It's an homage también to uh, these guys, these characters, all D groupers, right? Uh, older than me, who used to love to just hang out. Okay, is there something wrong with that? Just hanging out? <laughs> How come we're not allowed to do it then? How come it's not something that's encouraged? I mean, where was, when was the last time that you told somebody, you know what you really should just do today is not even go to class? Well, what should I do then? You know what? Go hang out, okay? Or when was it the last time that somebody told you, you know what? You've been working too hard. What I think you should do is just take the day off and just hang out, okay? We don't seem to do that in our society. <laughs> or if you do, what happens? You get in a little bit of trouble, right? Okay, so these guys, Los Heroes, that's the name of this poem. It's not Los Heroes. It's Los Heroes, okay? But when I was growing up as a kid and I'd be on the school bus coming home from school, I'd be looking out the window and I'd see a group of these guys, older guys in their teens or early 20s, and they'd all be hanging out down along the river underneath the cottonwood trees. And what were they doing? Hanging out, okay? And so they were my heroes. I wanted to grow up to be one of those guys. I wanted to grow up and hang out with them underneath the cottonwood trees. Somewhere along the way, other people had different plans for me, but that was my personal plan, was to grow up to be a D-grouper hanging out underneath the cottonwood trees, okay? So this is an homage to them. It's in Spanish, and it uses the colloquial Spanish. It uses the pachuquismos, right? Also known as calo, okay? And it's all nor northern New Mexico calo. So a lot of the words here, for those of you that are linguists or students of Spanish language, you're not going to find a lot of these words outside of northern New Mexico. And even within northern New Mexico, you're also only going to find it within certain contexts. What contexts are those? Where the D groupers hang out, right? <laughs> Los huachábamos cuando pasaban. Echando jumito azul en sus ramflas aplanadas como ranas de ojelata. Eran en los días de los heroes. Cuando había heroes, turiqueando en lengua mocha y risa torcida. Qué ahora nomás pasan los recuerdos uno tras del otro y mi corazón baila. Bendición, bendición es estar contento. 
Señor, gracias por, gracias, Señor, gracias por todo. Thank you. How are we doing? Am I keeping your interest, or is the energy starting to kind of, woo? Huh? Superb. All right. That's what we want to hear. I owe you $20, OK? <laughs> <laughs> or has the price gone up? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you guys know about Nuevo Mexico and its history? Anybody know a little bit about Nuevo Mexico and its history? Shelly, you must know a little bit. Yeah. You want to share just a little bit of what you know <laughs> while I breathe? <laughs> and you can stand up and face the firing squad. Written and published in Spanish. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's really pretty. We have a pretty history. <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about the the not so pretty history, the conflict between the indigenous peoples and the nuevos pobladores, the Spanish, when they came in in 1598 with Oñate? Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Very good, young lady. <laughs> you get an A+. Plus. Um, yes, and the conflict really unfortunately is that the reality and the truth behind that history it was very volatile, and the Spanish were not kind and did not treat the indigenous peoples very well. But in 1680, they rebelled, and that had what is considered the most successful rebellion uh, against any um, non-indigenous group of people in the northern hemisphere. And it was called, it's called the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And uh, that is part of that history. And so for those of us that are Nuevo Mexicanos, it is part of our history, but it's that complexity also because semos mestizos. I'm a mestizo. I have Indian blood and I have Spanish blood. And when am I Spanish and when am I, am I Indian? Right. So culturally, I'm not really that Indian because I didn't grow up in a Pueblo. I didn't grow up as a Diné, as a Navajo. I didn't grow up with those traditions, that uh, ritual, that ceremony. But there are so many other things about indigenous culture and customs that are part of my upbringing, and especially the worldview, because we share the same landscape, the same physical and cultural landscape. So in that way, I'm also indígena, even though I'm not considered indígena, even though my people have been permanent settlers in that area longer than the domatic tribes who are considered indigenous to that area, but I am not, even though we as a people have been there permanently longer. OK, so there's that complexity. And then also the denial throughout throughout the centuries from people who really claim to be European because it was better to be European, to be Spanish, and not to be Mexicano or to be Indio. And there are people in my family, on both sides of the family, who have that perspective, that position that somos españoles, somos europanos, we're pure blood. And there's no such thing anywhere, really, in this country where there's such a thing as pure blood, and much less in Nuevo Mexico. And so this poem is born out of that complexity out of that way of looking at this physical space and trying to make sense of it. And no better place for that to happen than in Taos, New Mexico. Have you guys, any of you been to Taos, Nuevo Mexico? If you have, you kind of have an understanding of what I'm talking about, right? Because there you really see the tricultural um, environment, the different groups of people. 
It's called Taos Nicho and it starts off in Spanish, but I know that I don't have to, this is really great. I'm all the way in Grand Rapids, Michigan and I don't even have to translate the Spanish. Whereas if I was in parts of New Mexico, I actually would have to translate the Spanish. So you give yourselves a good round of applause for that. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's really wonderful. Tus santos y tus velas, que me salvarán? Sin la cruz, no hay gloria. Pero como dice mi hermano Juan, todos quieren la gloria, pero nadie quiere la cruz. Indigenous mother encased in the dead dust of permanence, how fast the world goes us by, shadowy and flapping the, uh, like the clothes on the line in the backyard off a back road in ranchos. The sky darkening along the edge of the mountain, autumn storm clouds approaching slowly, as if set and framed within a landscape interpretation of an oil or pastel. To what direction should I cast out my prayers? The sun comes up still to the east, but my life is disoriented. My feet are fast and swift, but with no direction, no intent other than in the getting there. I feel like the Indian dancer in the painting whose headdress and plumes are frozen and whose gaze has been blushed out by a well-applied brushstroke. It is in the what is not there that one can sometimes find what is. On this day, en este día, el día de la Asunción de Nuestra Señora, I watched footage of last summer's parade on the local TV station, watched the young fiesta queen white gloved and crowned, waving her hand, flicking her wrist in perfect motion to the crowd along the procession as they do in events and places like Macy's or Pasadena. And the young caballeros and their stout horses trailed behind, yelling through perfect teeth, que viva la fiesta. Dressed as conquistadores, wearing their new grown beards and the latest style of sunglasses. And I thought of the Pueblo down road and what its people must feel for this reenactment. And I am everything at that point and nothing. For I feel joyous and celebratory for we have endured. My people, mi raza, los manitos, la huerfanda the orphaned ones whom Spain abandoned, Mexico did not adopt, and the US never wanted. And I feel the sorrow of the Indio because of that enduring. And my heart, if it could be captured, painted, and displayed, exhibited in the finest gallery where the locals do not enter, would be earthen, grayed, and splintered, a tinge of red, perhaps. Colors of the wooden crosses tilting in their final balance in the Camposantos, amongst the ruins of those first iglesias, destroyed in the Pueblo revolt of that not so long ago. Gracias. <clears throat> Thank you. Ascension, the rising. Some people take to picking up refundable materials on the roadside, scouring for discarded objects through the weeds and along the serrated edges of asphalt, using a recycled shovel handle and a rusted nail held with a band of electrical tape to its blunted end. They sift for aluminum, plastic, copper, anything of inconspicuous value that has been tossed out along the way, maybe even finding a fragmented piece of themselves. I too carry my own bag of refuse, attempting to resuscitate inklings of poems, fragments of verses and stanzas, images and memories scattered like roadkill. Tomorrow, I'll head north with the eastern light bathing my face, the past and the future swinging like a pendulum from the rear view mirror. I'll make the sign of the cross when I pass the descansos, their cross arms outstretched, embracing the sky like a hopeful mother, anticipating the return of her lost child. Just above La Bajada Hill, I'll tune the station to KDCE radio. The Mr. Ray Casillas morning program and the 9.30 a.m. rosary will be on. At 10 o'clock, the week's local obituaries will be announced. Years ago, at the age of 19, just below the last rise of the Lavajada, 
On our return trip home after days of looking for work, Sonny, Abel, and I pulled over to stretch our limbs and catch a breath of the fall air. We trailed each other up a ravine where we found a bottle with the wind softly whistling like a whispered promise out of its small rimmed mouth and we propped it up with a crude ring of stones. So whenever we pass through here, we will always remember this day, someone said, and we shook hands on it. From the edge of the barranco, we looked down at the Hayes Valley. AIDS faded baby blue 62 Ford Falcon station wagon stared at us, bumper sad and road weary. At our feet, shards of glass glistened against the red earth. At a roofing company trailer miles behind and days before, we had filled out job application forms and were hired on the spot, then told to sit in the lobby and wait for the crew boss to instruct us on where to go and what to do. We had just sat down to wait when Sonny picked up a guitar wedged into a corner and began plucking the three chord intro to Sweet Home Alabama. The red-haired, freckled-faced receptionist who just minutes before had offered us coffees and donuts stormed into the lobby, unleashing a torrential verbiage of insults, her voice whipping against the thin wood-paneled walls like a lightning bolt of crackling profanities and sounding like the lecturing teachers we thought we had forever left behind when we had dropped out of high school the spring before. Don't you know you ain't supposed to pick up someone's guitar without first asking for permission? You dumb fools, get your asses out of here, she said. Wham, boom, out the door we went into the cold morning chill, hollow stomach hungry and our necks twisted from nights of sleeping in the car. Pendejo zafau, cursed Abel and slapped the baseball cap off Sonny's head. And maybe that's just the way it's supposed to be for guys like us, a life of going upward on a downhill road, climbing against impossible odds and always ascending towards the unknown, against the mountain of struggles we bring upon ourselves, leaving pieces of this and that along the way. Little crumbling reminders to guide us back to where we started, back to our kin, back into the embrace of those who will welcome us as we are. Lost children, discarded, fragmented, with a crazy old song in our head and the hum of hope, faith, and promise leading us over the next rise and extending itself out like a friend's hand to pick us up when we're feeling blue. Yeah. Ronnie Van Zandt, one of the all-time greatest songwriters, right? Leonard Skinner, Ronnie Van Zandt. That was one of our all-time favorite bands in the village where I, where I grew up, too. So a lot of references to the music and to Leonard Skinner to appear uh, in our stories and in, and in my writings as well. There was something about uh, that idea that, well, not so much an idea, but the way of life and the way their worldview, their perspective, Leonard Skinner, you know, um, that somehow touched a chord in our nerve as well. Uh, very interesting because Southern boys, okay, Southern boys, and we were Northern New Mexico boys, but somehow in some way we were able to identify with our music very well, very closely, very powerfully, in fact. Uh, who grew up in a village like that that did not want to be a free bird, right? Uh, you guys grew up just like that? Ten minutes, oh, I thought you were saying me. I grew up in a village like that. <laughs> All right, so this is what we're going to do here. We're at that point now when we're down to the last poem. Whew, man, how do we get here? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. So here's what I'm going to ask. Um, I have three poems here, and one is called I Breathe the Cottonwood, OK? And then the other one is called Pancho Villa's Prayers. And then there's another one that is called One Last Cruise, Taos Plaza. So would you like for me to end with One Last Cruise, Taos Plaza, Pancho Villa's Prayers, or I Breathe the Cottonwood? All the Pancho Villas. OK, there's a few Pancho Villas. All the one last cruise, Taos Plaza. I breathe the cottonwood. Mmm, what do you think? Oh. 
Did somebody say all of them? Really? I don't know. You got to ask Shelly if I can go past my time limit. They want three. <laughs> I take the sagebrush scent in. The folding hills, the heat of the asphalt, 27 minutes past noon. Past the historic marker and the twisted metal road sign, the yellow apple dotted orchards, the alfalfa. I take it all in. For you, my brothers and sisters, lying on rubber mattresses in your jail pods, fingernailing the names of your loved ones on styrofoam cups. The cactus flower puckers its sweet magnolia lips for you today. His prickly arms stretching up towards the clouds and the sky. Las mesas, los arroitos, los barrancos, el Rio Grande, la urraca, el cuervo. The cigarette butt pinched and yellowed the crunched beer cans on the roadside. I take it all in. Past the presa and the remance, the swimming hole where you frolicked in the water with your first crush, her hair wet and pasted against the slant of her forehead, her bare shoulders glistening con la agua bendita. Throughout the Genizaro Valle, las milpas de maíz are lined in processions, their powdery tassels swaying back and forth like Pueblo feast day dancers. Atrás, adelante, atrás, adelante, ay, 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 Past the ancient flat-roofed houses slumped like loaves of bread and their backyard ornos with their black toothless mouths yawning. The acequias lazy gurgle, the tortolitas mid-afternoon murmur, the cleansing cota flower, los chapulines, las chicharras, el garambullo, el capulín. For you, my brothers and sisters, the willow, the mud puddles reflecting brown, the earth's skin. I Take it all in. <clears throat> Pancho Villa's prayers. So um, my talk this afternoon really was on ethno poetry. And this is really an ethno poem. Okay, so don't ask me to explain ethno poetry all over again because I did a really good job this afternoon. I'm afraid <laughs> that if I try to explain it again, I would really mess up. But um, those that were those that were in the audience, they know what ethno poetry is now, so you can ask them. All right, but even if you don't know what ethno poetry is, at least you can say I've heard one ethno poem. <laughs> My name is Carlos Luis. Nickname is Pancho Villa. I grew up with that name since I was eight years old. I'm Yaki Pascua. My grandparents, they come from Nogales, Mexico side, but they grew up over there in Grandstone, Old Pascua. Now this song is the Lord's Prayer and it goes like this. Hana yo, hana yo ina, hana yo ina, hana yo sana. Amen. These are the blessing of all the best songs that the Lord gave me. I don't know why he gave me these songs, but he gave them to me. And I share them with you. I sing the most powerful songs. May God bless you all. May God bless you all, man. It's all that I can do for you, my brothers. I sing the most powerful songs. I sing the most powerful songs that I can for you. They are not witching songs. They are blessing songs. God bless and good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience. Appreciate it. What have you learned the uh, most? I mean, how has not how has the re how has the region you came from uh, shaped your poetry, and what have you learned most from your people? Do you think? I, I'm sorry. What was the question? Uh, how how has the region you're from uh, shaped your poetry, and what have you learned most from your people? Wow, what have I learned the most from my people? To not want to be like them. <laughs> 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 uh, 
you know, what can I say? Those are my people. Everything that I know, everything that I understand, everything that I don't know, and everything that I don't understand, I've learned from them. Okay, in how I see the world and how I make an understanding of the world that I see and the world that I inhabit, it's my understanding based on growing up there, right? And the things that I don't understand about the world that I inhabit also is referential to that place and those people too. I carry the same world perspective that they have. So what's interesting about being bilingual in the way that I am is that oftentimes throughout, multiple times throughout the course of a day, I encounter a situation that doesn't make sense to me and how I translate it to myself and try to make sense of it is through that language that comes from that place where I grew up. I revert back to that understanding that is instinctual to me. So that's what I learned, I guess, from my people and how I carry myself through this world and what I make sense of it, whether I'm lost in an airport in Chicago, for example, like what would a manito like me do? You know, hey, go have a hot dog. You know, <laughs> re hang out. You know, relax till the, the relax till the dust settles. You know, yeah. 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 So, and what was the second part or the first part of your question? Yeah. Well, obviously uh, through language, right? Again, but uh, also the the perspectives, the worldview, and and uh, I think that like the <laughs> the second book. A Poetry of Remembrance, New and Rejected Works. Um, it had a thousand prints in hardcover. And a month after it was published, uh, it was sold out. And I was still doing book signings and book readings and going across the state and to other states, in fact. And I didn't have any books to take with me. So I'd have to go back to some of the bookstores that I had visited before and ask them if I could take some books from them so I could take on to the next reading. And they were like, well, how many books do you need? Well, I think I'm gonna need about 20 or 30, maybe 40. Well, you know, I can only let you have 10. <laughs> and so the thing about it is that the poetry, which is a surprise to the publisher, a surprise to me, what you guys heard tonight, is that there's actually an audience for that poetry, an accepting audience, an audience that is interested in that kind of poetry, in that presentation of the world that I come from, because it wasn't just Nuevo Mexicanos or Chicanos like myself and those of us that are from Nuevo Mexico that were buying the book, but it was also people like yourselves who come from another background, another culture that found uh, a resonance with the stories and the poems to your own lives, right? And so I think in that way, that's what I take from my people and I transfer it into the page. Uh, and really, maybe it's more of the oral tradition that I take the presentation of the oral stories and the histories that come through that. And I just add form and structure to it, right? Ethnopoetry, again, we talked about that this afternoon, but really adding the form just to everyday vernacular uh, stories and colloquialisms and dialect. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Have you or anyone written verse? I, well, I'm sorry, music notes to your verse? Um, Let's see, not formally music, but um, I used to do a lot of uh, presentations with my brothers who were musicians, and they, they were guitarists, amazing guitarists. They wouldn't actually write notations or, uh, or song, you know, the, the musical score for the poems, but they would write actual musical scores just in their heads and perform them in live. So that has been done before, yeah. A Trump. Only like at parties where things get kind of crazy and somebody <laughs> <laughs> and somebody pulls out a drum, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It all sounds really cool too. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find having two languages at your disposal helpful to your poetry, or does it kind of like prevent you because you're like, how do I translate this mm -hmm. Spanish word to English or vice versa? Yeah, no, it's really great because again, it goes back to uh, the struggle that I have sometimes with the world that I inhabit, which is like when I can't make sense of it in one language, I make sense of it in another language. And so that's really the poetry uh, helping me along, right? It's not a hindrance at all. In fact, it, it helps me. Um, and also, I think it broadens the, my, the audience too for other people, whether they can speak Spanish or not, they, they see the two languages working together and maybe they're bilingual as well. Maybe they're French and English or maybe German and English or maybe this or that. And they can see that they can actually form one poem out of two different languages, maybe even three. 
When you're writing your poetry, do you prefer to write more based off of the collective history of your people, or do you like talking about your own personal history? Which um, <clears throat> I kind of really, I don't make that choice. It's not a conscious decision. Uh, it's kind of like what the poem wants to be and what it tells me that it wants to be, and then that's where the that's where the struggle occurs, right? The wrestling match between the poem and me. And the poem wants to say one thing, and I think it should say something else. The poem wants to go here, and I think it should go over there. And sometimes it's a compromise. Uh, and sometimes it's not a compromise. Sometimes the poem wins. Sometimes I win, OK? But it is that match between what I'm wanting to do and what the poem wants to do. Uh, but it's not a conscious de decision, it's a creative process. And when you're really emerged in the creative process, you're not even, I mean, I'm talking about really being emerged in the creative process. And those of you that have written, or your musicians, your artists, your photographers, whatever your arte is, and I imagine that everybody in here has some form of art, some form of arte, you understand what I'm talking about. When you have reached that place where the duende resides, we talked about the duende earlier, when you reach that place where the duende resides and he's your companion or she's your companion, you know, you're not in this world at that moment. And that's what's really cool about being an artist and being en able to enter into that space. You were in that space for 10 years working on your book. Yeah, zoned out. And you come up for air every now and then, right? But you're kind of like zoned out for as long as that you're engaged in that process. And when you are engaged in that process, that's, you know, that's what's going on. Uh, but it's not conscious, it's subconscious. At least when it's really, really working good for it, when you're at that point where you should be, it's subconscious. I think if you're too much, too conscious in the process, then you're not quite there. Um, can you touch briefly on how you overcame the adversity of dealing with the cards that you were dealt at an early age and with the grief of the losses in your family as well? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, I almost have an answer for everything except for that because um, I don't really know how I overcame all that. I think I overcame it because of the nature of my household and in my family and my relatives. They were strong people and they were not people that felt like they were below anything or anyone. And so I never saw myself as being in fear or being a degrouper or being somebody that couldn't do what they wanted to do. Right? It was just some, I was fortunate that I had that kind of nurturing in my home life, whereas a lot of those other kids that I went to school with may not have had that. Maybe it could be the reason why a lot of them aren't around anymore, but I was fortunate and blessed that I had grandparents who were strong in that way, tios and tias and relatives and parents and just the community around me, right? The immediate community around me. And then I had the most amazing uh, high school English teacher and high school art teacher when I went to a, um, a boarding school outside of my village two, two, uh, two hours away in Albuquerque and it was a boarding school and that probably really is the most significant factor about what probably may have saved my life because it pulled me out of my environment and I was in this boarding school with kids who were coming from similar backgrounds like myself from the villages, but it was a school where you had kids coming from Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, uh, Iran, Denver, Los Angeles, New York, wherever, they were coming from all over the place and at 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, 18 years old, you were introduced to the bigger world around you and it really took you out of your small myopic environment where I was coming from. Um, teachers who, Rambo, Steinbeck, and Camus, that introduced me to those authors, right? That could make sense of my appreciation and passion for Bob Dylan's music, you know, would take me by the hand to the library and take me to the, what was it, the card catalog? <laughs> or was that what it was called, the index card, <laughs> right? Yeah, remember those? I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you're looking for information on something, it wasn't like just at the flick of a button or the press of a button, and all of a sudden every, a million things come up on, uh, on the computer back then. It was like if you really wanted to find out about something, you really had to do your search for it. But I had teachers like those, like Mrs. Rutassel, for example, that took a real interest in this shy, introverted, skinny kid, right, who always had his head just buried in his notebook drawing or writing poems. At a time when it wasn't safe, in many ways it's still not safe for a young male particularly a young Chicano male, to be writing poems. That's not something that you did. Uh, you got beat up for that. 
slam poetry. Slam poetry has really popularized it and made it safe for everybody to write poetry in a way that academic poets or instructors of academic poetry have not been able to do. So we owe a lot of credit for the healing that occurs in society to the slam poets and the spoken word communities. Support your local slam poetry community. Do you guys have one here? Yes. Yeah, very good, very good, great, yeah. Um, you've spoken a little bit about kind of reaching off across cultures and like imparting the wisdom of like one culture into another. Um, what do you think are some of the most universal themes that kind of transcend culture and can kind of be applied to everywhere? Happiness, sadness, love, pain, all the things that make us human and that are universal in all languages. And uh, when I started teaching creative writing workshops in Taos, I used to te teach week-long creative writing workshops for students that came from all over the country. And for the most part, they were older students, maybe in their 30s on and upward, even in their 70s. Um, but, and this is going back like almost 30 years ago now when I was teaching those workshops. Well, as the workshop facilitator, what I realized early on is that what you do that's the most important thing for you to do is that you create an atmosphere of trust and comfort at the table. And when people open themselves up in that way to you and you open, first of all, you have to be the one that opens yourself up to them. You have to create that atmosphere. You have to make it feel for them like it's a safe environment in which they can do that. And when you do that, and when you do that together, when you do it together as a community, whether it's a community of two, or a community of 10, or a community of 500,000 people, or a community of how many people are we in the United States now, when you do it as a form of healing, then that's when you get the humanness and the universality of it, right? That's when it works in that way. Whereas now, what seems to be the issue and the problem is that instead of unity, there is division because we're lacking artists, right? That's one of the things that's really hurting us in this country is that there isn't enough funding for our programs for the healing that needs to occur. But that's the universal link between all of us is when we open up ourselves to those things, to those emotions, and to feel comfortable and to feel, feel safe that we're able to share them with each other. Levi, thank you so much. Uh, it's great for me to hear the Novo Mexicanismos over here, Marcos. Um, I wanted to go I back heard a to- I voice somewhere and I'm yeah. like- <laughs> I wanted to go back for just a moment to this figure of Oñate that, that you and Shelley uh, brushed up upon. For some of you who don't know, Oñate is reported to have uh, cut the feet, the feet off of slaves, uh, the Indians, when um, they would try to run away and do these things. And then many years ago, when a statue of Oñate was put up, somebody went and cut off Oñate's foot uh, to remind everybody of this other part of his history. And Oñate, for me, is such a difficult character because, like, like you say, the, the part of you wants to sort of push him away and say, that's wrong, you know, that the treatment of the indigenous people is wrong. At the same part, he represents this instrumental part of New Mexico, that combination of the Spanish and the Mestizo as well. And I just sort of wanted to hear sort of how you interpret that figure of Oñate. Not, not the man necessarily, but just the representation, what he represents. I guess it's kind of like, you know, in everybody's family, I think, for the most part, you have that crazy uncle, you know, who's always screwing up. Um, and he's not, I'm not talking about the uncle that screws up to the point where like, everybody laughs, you know, but I'm talking about the crazy uncle that really screws up to the point where he causes a lot of pain to those around him, most immediately his family members. And for me, I kind of have that relationship with Oñate. He was that uncle that caused so much pain that there is shame in that. You know, and there's no redeeming quality in that too. But I can't erase it, I can't deny it, I can't negate it. It's part of who I am. I myself don't have like a connection to it. I myself really don't feel connected to Oñate in that way. But everybody else, especially the indigenous peoples from New Mexico or indigenous peoples that know that history, connect me to him. People who move to New Mexico that find out about that history connect me to him. Right, and so whatever healing there has occurred over the last 500 years between the two peoples, all of a sudden the scabs are pulled back by people who are interested in that conflict and in that story. So I actually am interested in the other story. I'm interested in the story of reconciliation. I'm, story, I'm interested in the story of um, 
of the symbiotic relationship between the Pueblos and the Hispanos because amongst the non-academics, both in the Pueblo world and the Hispanic world, you never hear them really talking about that conflict. You don't hear the, the elders at the Pueblos talking about that conflict, even though they know about that history. You don't hear the ancianos in the villages talking about that conflict, even though they're aware of it too, right? What they talk about is the relationships between the two peoples, and they talk about being vecinos, neighbors, and being good neighbors throughout their time, throughout their history, and how they would go visit the Pueblos, and they would spend maybe a weekend there for their feast day. And then the stories I hear from the Pueblos is how they would go into the villages and spend a few days there when that village was having its feast day. That's the story that I'm interested in. And it's not to say that we have to forget or to deny that other history, but too much too much is focused on that, not by the local vernacular, but by people who are not a part of that history, who um, can afford to have that distance and be removed from it and to really be able to point it out. But I think that the story that really needs to be told is about the sharing again, that symbiotic relationship. So for me, it's like, yes, that uncle really, really messed up, but that's not my story. That's his story. My story is different. Thank you so much. I'd like to conclude with two things. Um, shortly hereafter, Levi Romero will be outside to sign books if you would like to, if you have one already or if you would like to purchase one. And then also if you are a student here for a class, there are sign-up sheets. I don't know if you noticed those when you were walking in. And so to conclude, please thank Levi Romero. Thank you.